That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Smile, the directorial debut <laughs> of Parker Finn, uh, which uh, premiered at the 2022 Fantastic Fest and will be released in theaters courtesy of Paramount Pictures, September 30th, 2022. Directorial debut. A debut, although loosely based uh, on some ideas he explored in an earlier short, short film called Laura Hasn't Slept. I quite like this movie. I did too. The original title was Something's Wrong with Rose. Oh, I thought the title should have been Trauma. <laughs> tra tra trauma. Or Suicide Ghost. Well, actually, Spoiler, I guess. It also reminded me of this 2008 Kristen Scott Thomas drama called I've Seen You Smile, which that would have been creepy considering. Well, since I just halfway spoiled it, uh, so spoiler heavy, I guess. It's very spoiler heavy. The studio seems to think that this is a highly original film. Uh... I really like this film. I, I think it is very good. It is very good. It's adult and it is intelligent. I, I don't know that the mechanism for what's going on is that as we'll get into. It's not inventive. Uh, but, uh, but yes, we'll be spoiler heavy and obviously you should see the film first. Okay. We find out that there is like an evil entity that travels from person to person through an individual's trauma. Like, like, a, that, like, like that makes their mind vulnerable. Like a virus. Like a virus. So how this manifests is this en entity will climb into someone and sort of encourage them to commit suicide in front of another person in a very traumatic way so that the other person is traumatized. And notably the transmission is implied. Oh, meaning we don't see it. Yes. Right. Yeah. There, there's no uh, crop dusting happening or mm -hmm. anything. Okay. So we focus on one person, a psychiatrist named Rose. Mm-hmm. Played by Sosie Bacon. I thought the opening was very strong because we see Rose working in an acute psychiatric facility and a patient comes in. And this is all before the credits roll. A patient comes in, a young lady who's a grad student. And she is saying that she is seeing things, um, like this evil thing that is making her want to do bad things. And all of a sudden, this young lady slits her throat from ear to ear. With the creepy smile on her face. With the creepy smile on her face, which is obviously traumatic to Rose. And then there begins Rose... Uh, sort of devolving and we're told so it's very so it's familiar because it's very much like the ring um and many stories like that where it's like someone experiences something and then they have a week to live so we're told that we find out that anyone who experiences this or receives the transmission uh it made it seem like ground shipping postal service they have four to seven days mm -hmm. before they will kill themselves so Rose is trying to figure out answers, and she's able to because she has an ex-boyfriend named Joel, who's played by... Kyle Gallner. I feel like I know this, like I recognize this person. He was a child-slash-teen actor who was in a, actually a lot of genre films about a decade ago, like Jennifer's Body and the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, oh. Haunting in Connecticut. He, oh, and, maybe that's how I, yeah. And I know uh, I, we saw a pretty well-done melodrama called Beautiful Boy, where he pr plays Maria Bello's kid that shoots... Uh, does a school shooting. Uh, he's uh, but he he looks completely transformed. He was also in the Scream reboot earlier this year. Oh, I liked him. But anyway, he plays Rose's ex, who's like a detective, and we learn a lot of information because she goes to him asking for help, and he basically pieces together through like uh, police reports that. People who have committed suicide, there's like a report a week earlier where they witnessed a suicide and then he keeps going back and back until he he like finds 20 people who were all part of this like suicide string and they all kill themselves except one person and this one person, they go to find him because they think he might be able to crack the code. He's currently in jail. And did they say Altoona? Mm-hmm. Because this movie set in New Jersey. And he's in a jail because he killed someone. And he explains the only way to break the like the chain is to kill someone in front of someone else. So that person's traumatized and then the spirit can jump from you to them. A triangulated trauma. But Rose doesn't want to do that. She doesn't want to kill anyone. So she comes up with the idea that if this entity wants someone to witness the trauma, all she needs to do is stay like in isolation. But of course... Her ex-boyfriend's like, girl, you can't spend the rest of your life by yourself. So 
she does end up killing herself in front of Joel. And now we would assume Joel has the evil spirit, the end. So it's not a happy ending. Nothing is resolved. <laughs> no, it, it, it actually was kind of a troubling, uh, unsettling film. It made me feel really kind of hopeless in a lot of scenes. So just going through my notes, I thought, again, very strong opening. I really liked the sound editing and the cinematography. Mm -hmm. There are some really cool shots. Mm -hmm. um, it was shot, shot by Charlie Seraph, who uh, lends the film I liked called Pink Skies Ahead a couple years ago, as well as that film Relic. We reviewed which i think was from new zealand uh, that's kind of a metaphorical horror film about dementia okay where they go to the the older mother's house oh yes yeah. yep okay when we meet the detectives after rose's patient kills herself one of them is joel her ex-boyfriend and then this other guy and these both of them were garbage which I thought, because they're using language that is very insensitive to people who are having like severe mental health issues, which is particularly heinous considering they're sitting in a mental facility talking to a psychiatrist. But I think the point of that is the stigma at large culturally yes. of mental health issues is that reaction. Well, and also sort of the need for law enforcement agents to, I mean, they don't get training to deal with mental, like, like people who are having or experiencing mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So I... It, even though it was troubling to see, it, it felt probably pretty on the mark for how a lot of people handle these scenarios. Or how people feel whenever cops have to be called and are asking questions. <laughs> so Rose, played by... Sosie Bacon. I thought she did a really good job because she seems super fragile. She's super thin. She reminded me of a cross between like Carrie Mulligan and Lily Taylor. Uh, I'd have to look up those people. Um, but I liked her look. She seems fragile. She's also like, it's very obvious that she holds in a lot of her emotions. Um, well, we the opening scene is her, a flashback of her as a child finding her mother dying uh, in a, during a suicide attempt. Right. And and then we, we learn, we actually learn quite a, a bit of details about her kind of attachment styles, her family issues, because she has an older sister, Holly, uh, who shows up and there's an interesting scene with a cat and a birthday party and she's in a new relationship uh, with a fiance played by Jesse T. Usher, Trevor, Trevor. Uh, who I also thought was kind of used in unexpected ways. Sure. But uh, Rose, because she wants to always keep it together, keep it together, um, after the patient kills herself, of course, Rose is upset. She goes home and her version of like stress relief is she pours like the weakest little like three ounce pour of white wine <laughs> and the way she's drinking it is I, I thought it was very well done because it seems like for her like that was like well it's so like timid and secretive and in in the dark against the fridge yeah compared to other mouse. people who would just crack open like a box of wine and some edibles and some pills and that wouldn't be enough and here she is with her little three ounces like oh i thought that was cute mm. um so a, there are a lot of creepy moments mm -hmm. that I think are a, a level above basic jump scares. One of the first ones is Rose is at home alone when the alarm system goes off and then the alarm company calls. And we get several moments where a lot of what's happening to Rose is in her head. Mm -hmm. So the alarm company calls and says like, what's your name and password? And then she's like, someone broke into my home. And they go, are you alone? She's like, I don't... Or she goes, I think so. And they go, are you sure? That was creepy. No, I like the part where they, that voice, uh, the very soothing woman's voice says, did you let something in, Rose? And then she goes, look behind you. Mm -hmm. That was creepy. That reminded me of uh, the first Insidious film, when they wake up in the middle of the night and that door is open. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But you already alluded to Rose having a dream about her mother. Rose has, a, like, I think three dreams about this woman who we later find out is her mother. Her mother suffered from mental health issues and ultimately committed suicide. But then really we learned that the reason Rose has a lot of unresolved... Rose has trauma that she hasn't resolved relating to her mother's death. And it's because when the mom died, it appears she overdosed on pills, because we see the pills... And then the mother had asked Rose to call for help, and Rose didn't. Well, she was very young, though. She's well, like, she was old enough to call the police, and then she admits that she didn't because she was tired of, like, her mom. She says her mom was a monster and was probably relieved that her mom was dead, but she feels guilt. So we learned that towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, 
Rose goes, there's another really good scene where, because Rose's boss, like the head played, of the psychiatry Played department, by Cal Penn of Harold and Kumar. Is he the gay guy? Yeah, uh, what gay guy? That man. Her boss, Cal Penn, the yeah. actor? I don't know. Oh. I don't know his sexual orientation. Oh. Anyway, he tells her, like, I'm worried about you and I need you to take some time off. So she does, and we see her go visit her own therapist who she hasn't seen in a while. And I thought that was a very good scene because it, it, it's well written because you can tell that here's this person, like two people who do the same job and they're playing a game. And then in the end, we find out the only reason Rose dragged her ass up there is because she wants a prescription for some antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was well done. Yeah, and the language used about how she feels, she's talking about how witnessing that suicide was, uh, what did she say, it was unsettling and corporeal, like, was very good. I also really like the actor that is playing her, her ex-therapist, Robin Weigert, yep. who gives, a, she's a kind of a fantastically soothing presence in this, but she is a great lead performance in a film directed by Stacey Passant from a few years ago called Concussion, where she hits her head and her sexual orientation starts to oh. uh, uh, flourish in, diff in interesting ways. But uh, she's also in uh, Take Me to the River. Uh, that sounds like a song. Anyway, uh, yeah, she. That, I liked her a lot. I really liked the scene where they go visit Rob Morgan in prison. He's, he's the one that has survived this daisy chain. Yep. So... Rose uh, has a cat named Mustache, which it didn't even occur to me until you pointed out that the name might have significance because a mustache can hide or alter a smile. A smile. Mm -hmm. But the cat goes missing, and it's during the time that Rose is sort of, you know, she's starting to devolve mentally, and she's also supposed to go to her nephew's birthday party, this little boy named Jackson. And to make a long story short, we find out that because the cat goes missing and it would appear that Rose killed the cat and she wrapped the cat up as a gift to give to Jackson. <laughs> so when Jackson opens the gift, it's, I mean, obviously it's a very extreme moment. Talk about trauma. Probably the weakest point of the film for me was Rose's behavior once the little boy opens the box. Because she kind of, it's a little bit much. It, well, it becomes very, dis well, it's like we're on a train that is going one direction and we have to go there and the discombobulation is real. Uh, but I don't mind that because once we, I, I, I really like the final, um, what happens in the house in the last 10 minutes of the film. Sure. Um, when Trevor, so after the birthday party, Rose hurts herself pretty badly because she falls through like a glass coffee table. So while she's in the hospital, her boss shows up and is very concerned about her. We see Rose's sister arguing with Trevor. Then we see Trevor drive his fiance home. And even before they get in the house, Rose is trying to explain to him that basically I think there's like this evil entity like haunting me. And I wrote down that Trevor looks at her and is like, hell no, I am not dealing with this. And he basically says that. Mm -hmm. And then that's sort of the end of him in the movie. So we would assume that... Well, he calls her therapist to the house. At one right. Point, but yeah. But and, and then we see her sort of run into the arms of her ex, who then she had... We, we learn she kind of left him because she felt like she had put up... She had built up a wall. Mm -hmm. And around him, that wall was crumbling. And she got a, she became afraid. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, I kind of like that. And you mentioned something about Trevor's character. But I thought that it... It felt very authentic that he was just like, no, I'm mm -hmm. not. Yeah, like I didn't sign up for this. We're not married yeah. yet. Uh, that That's the whole purpose of being engaged is so I can make sure I want to do this. And guess mm -hmm. what? I don't. <laughs> um, go ahead. Well, I think what you're probably leading up to is I, I think that if there's any criticism of it, that the narrative had been a little bit more refined to the degree of something like the Babadook. Jennifer Kent's film from 2014, uh, in, in our relationship to trauma and how we always kind of have to <clears throat> tend that darkness because it doesn't really ever go away. Yeah, I think this storyline is very familiar of like an evil entity bouncing from one person to the next and there are rules and there's a main character that has to sort of, you know, crack the code. There are many, many examples of that kind of story. I think... For that sort of derivative storyline, I think this movie is on that very high end of that. Well, because that is that is what The Ring is, which of course is a remake right. of Ringu, the Japanese horror film. Uh, but Baba, the Babadook transcends that because it, it really does a fine job of blurring the line between like mental illness and a supernatural component. 
And I think that this film can't do that because it's relying heavily on this idea of this evil entity that is bouncing from one. And I kind of wish that maybe we would have just focused on Rose and then as the audience, you know, everything we're seeing looks supernatural, but it's all in her mind, so that's fine. I, I almost wish I didn't know that this thing was happening to a bunch of people. I wanted to get lost in her own psychosis. Right. Well, because that also uh, generates some hope then, too. Sure. Because it feels, it's like at the, you know, where the anxiety is that, you know, maybe it's part of this still is in her head and she can defeat it somehow. And, uh, and of course she can't. Uh, We also get imagery of, for, of some of the people who were forced to kill themselves and they're pretty extreme acts. One of them, um, I believe it's the, the guy who killed himself in front of the grad student who killed herself in front of Rose, he bludgeoned himself in the head with like a blunt object. Mm-hmm. And then we see his face and like his jaws all cracked. And Oh yeah. And that looked we, good. We see his ex-wife cause um, Rose goes to see him. Judy Reyes from scrubs. Yeah. That's a good scene because mm-hmm. that's when all, well, it's interesting because the, that lady, allows Rose into her house because she thinks Rose is a reporter. But then when Rose admits, like, I'm also seeing the things your husband saw, the wife gets really upset and kicks her out, mm-hmm. which I thought was... I, I I was surprised by the wife's reaction. I would have thought that she would have been more scared than upset. Um, and also, he had a very elaborate collection of things related to this smiley demon. Uh, that kind of felt like insidious when the boy was drawing the black. But it's also like he only, you know, had a weak tops, right? With this disease. Uh, again, but... it feels very familiar mm-hmm. in that regard. Um, Rose, at one point, when she realizes she, if she wants to break the chain, she has to kill someone. We get a sequence where she kills a patient. That's pretty extreme. Yes. But that... it's all in her mind. Mm-hmm. Um, With her boss as the witness. Yeah, that was pretty good. I thought a really good line that probably could be the tagline of the movie is when the the end of the film when Rose is at her childhood home and as the audience, it's made very clear that she's going to try to like destroy her trauma, which is the death of her mother and reconciling her feelings about it. The mother, like like the figure that we see as her mother, which is this beautiful lady, turns into like this big monster. Mm-hmm. And then Rose asks her, why? Like, why are you doing this to me? And the evil spirit says, your mind is so inviting. Mm-hmm. I thought that was creepy. It's, but the visuals of the mom... The visuals are so good. In they were very good. Because it also... She becomes this hulking giant that looks, you know, not unlike Marilyn Manson. And then, uh, literally, uh, Rose's jaws get pulled open and she's kind of devouring this, this you know, personification of trauma. Uh, yeah, we see Rose eating her trauma, which looks like the big monster has skinned itself. Mm-hmm. So we see the skinned monster pulling open Rose's mouth like something out of Beetlejuice. That looked really good. Then we see Rose set her mom slash monster on fire. That looked really good. But, you know, another sort of weakness in the story is that obviously the trauma that rose experience that caused the entity to jump into her is related to that grad student not her mother not her mother yeah so then she kills her mother effectively like that trauma but then she's still infected by the so i was a little unsatisfied by that like i knew it wasn't going to help her and it doesn't she still ends up killing herself sure but if it's a hit there'll be a franchise now but it looked amazing it did uh it also another film that it reminded me of was the i think it was a 1997 film with denzel washington called fallen mm. where that demon is jumping from people and seeing time is on my side by the stones mm. all the time which i have fond memories of that movie but this movie surprised me not in you know there's a movie called the empty man which i really really liked yeah. it took me on a journey i was not expecting i actually probably want to rewatch that soon this movie kind of gives me that vibe of like oh this is not When I saw the trailer, I thought I was going to get something like a happy death day or something like Mm -hmm. that. But this is much more serious, much, uh, yeah, I, I would recommend it very and, and considering the running time because it's nearly two hours fly, it didn't it feel flies by. Yeah, yeah it flew by um i i read that because of test audiences uh this was going to be a streaming premiere but they've decided based on reactions to it to go theatrical uh but yeah this is definitely the kind of stuff i i would prefer to see mm-hmm. i mean you know like or, you know original is maybe not any longer possible with some kind of genre elements but uh yeah i really like this film what would you give it? Three and a half. I would give it three and a half out of five as well. 
Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.